thanks very much uh, to the BITS team for the opportunity to present. Um, I also want to uh, give a thanks to Comparative Political Studies, the editors who made possible um, this pilot study that we did um, over the past uh, year or so, um, which the, the special issue should come out, I believe, uh, sometime in spring of 2016. So hopefully just four or five months from now we should uh, have this in print. So the motivation for what we did here is um, based on just kind of observing, you know, that there's lots of discussion right now about publication bias and transparency and so forth. Um, and we've contributed to a lot of this. Uh, at least I think three of the four of us are part of the, uh, I guess it's now called Evidence and Governance and Politics Network, EGAP. Uh, we've pre-registered, I think three of the four of us have pre-registered. We've done a lot of these things. Uh, but a lot of the solutions that are being proposed right now seem to be in the abstract. And what we wanted to do here was to actually try to conduct some sort of live fire exercise and learn what happens when you implement um, pre-registration uh, and results-free reviewing um, in practice. Uh, what, you know, what sort of what could we learn from this? What might be the implications of moving forward? I don't need to convince this crowd uh, or even probably define publication bias or, or whatnot here, but let me skip to the last point here and just sort of talk for a moment about how and why we observe publication bias. We often, I mean, spend a lot of time talking about pea phishing and pea hacking, and, and the implicit assumption there is that the researcher uh, maybe has uh, either some sort of nefarious intention or may just be following you know, existing practices and norms that encourage people to try to identify significant results. But in either case, the, the, um, the authors are sort of implicitly, I guess, blamed for um, you know, searching for significance and publishing that and so forth. And uh, we wonder here whether um, the review process or just how much uh, uh, effect there is from the review process on uh, what shows up in, um, in journals. And so the, the efforts here to do this special issue on pre-registration and results-free reviewing are targeted at trying to understand, I think, the latter a little bit more of uh, what happens when you sort of alter the incentives of the review process. What might you get from authors uh, otherwise? And, and so um, let me just, uh, I guess, identify a couple of the different possibilities that sort of come out. In political science, at least, and I assume probably economics and the other social sciences, replication has become a huge deal. Probably for 20 or so years in political science, this debate has been, I guess it's not really a debate, I guess this movement has really been growing, and there's been a, a, a pretty strong endorsement by lots of journals and individuals and organizations and so forth to do replication. And um, we're going to argue here that the replication is just not sufficient, right? So, I mean, just the very question of what is replication is a really complex and elusive question to answer. Um, this can't all just be about being able to take someone else's code uh, and execute the code and, uh, and just recover the same results. There's a lot more that goes into replication, um, and yet a lot of that uh, is probably not being done. Uh, fairly thin standards for posting replication files. Most journals have, or many of the top journals have, replication policies. Uh, but, you know, they're often uh, fairly thin standards here. So, uh, one example, I uh, maybe uh, six months ago I downloaded some replication code from one of the major journals and uh, opened up the script file here, the executable script file, and and learned that, um, well, and the, the actual data themselves, I guess, and, and I could, I could re-estimate the models just fine, like the, you know, the coefficients came out, the stars, whatever, that was all fine. Um, what I couldn't do, though, was actually do anything else with the data, because they had included only the variables used in the analysis and did not include any identifiers, okay, for any of the subjects, any of the entities in the, in the, in the study. Right, so I could not merge in new variables, just really couldn't do anything. I mean, I could fiddle with you know, transformations of existing variables, but otherwise couldn't do a whole lot more, right? So, um, so the, the, the replication or sort of posting standards are, are fairly thin and probably need to, and, and probably are in the process of being boosted. Um, so in general, robust replication uh, is mostly just not possible still, and so we need other ways to get at this uh, issue of uh, boosting transparency. So pre-registration uh, has been uh, floated a lot lately as a, as a solution. So, um, you know, pre-registration, the idea that, you know, before you go out and conduct a study, you go on record, providing a bunch of information. Hopefully everyone's familiar uh, with pre-registration practices. But it may not be uh, a panacea here, right? I mean, uh, pre-registration documents, if you've, if you've gone through them, uh, you see, one, you see there's really no kind of... Uh, uh, formal, I guess, standards for what you would put in a pre-registration document. Some of that's emerging uh, at the EGAP and 
Uh, I think the AEA, I guess, has a registry now and others, and, and sort of that, that process is moving along, but, but there's just tremendous variability in what gets posted. And so you see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of difficulties in these pre-registration documents, such as hypothesis trolling, uh, as we might call it. So the idea that you sort of state a bunch of ambiguous hypotheses, right, and then, you know, maybe at some point down the road, one or more of those pans out in some way, right? So. Um, uh, it might be that you pre-register multiple measurements. If you take every possible measurement of democracy and say, hey, we're going to try all of these measures, Polity and Freedom House and Van Hannen and, and any of the others, right? I mean, sort of if you just sort of say that you can do them all, then suddenly you open yourself up to down the road being able to just sort of try everything, right? And, and, uh, and then, you know, you might sort of just push for lots and lots of subsample analyses. I'm not suggesting that these are inherently wrong and, and we should be pre-registering uh, subsample analyses and so forth, uh, but it opens up the possibility, pre-registration just opens up the possibility to just pack in a lot of different, uh, you know, possibilities so we can sort of cover ourselves on the back end, so. Um, also with pre-registration, I mean, uh, reviewers must download and compare manuscripts to pre-analysis plans. Okay, uh, that's a big assumption that reviewers are going to do that. Even if we can solve the problems of having journal editors merge, uh, talked with the registries back and forth so that pre-analysis plans can be anonymized and provided to reviewers, uh, still the reviewer has to go and read another document, okay? Um, you know, if you look at pre-analysis plans, uh, you know, some of those can be fairly lengthy. Some of those can be four and five and six and seven times longer than the paper itself, right? So there's a, I mean, there's a real question about whether reviewers are, are going to go and, and do some of this and how can editors and registries make it possible for, um, for reviewers to, to engage in this um, practice. So, uh, a third way to do this is to do results-free review, and I should say, you know, pre-registration is just a special case of, of results-free review, uh, but there's another process here which would be have manuscripts that can be submitted, be they prospective or retrospective, so uh, meaning the, the study could have already been fully completed, okay? Uh, but scrub the, scrub the paper of all possible mention uh, uh, of results and allow journal editors to circulate the papers um, to reviewers and get feedback and go all the way down the road to acceptance of the paper, okay, uh, without ever seeing the results, okay? So in this case, hopefully the, the focus would be, reviewer focus would be on theory and research design and, and not on results. Reviewers are always going to speculate, um, but, uh, but hopefully there would be no mention and reviewers would shift their energies um, elsewhere. Um, one other thing that results free review could do is provide a better solution for observational studies than pre-registration can. There's, a, I think, a healthy debate about whether pre-registration is appropriate for observational studies or, excuse me, um, about whether pre-registration is, is simply just most appropriate for prospective research designs and not for other types of designs of which many observational studies um, uh, fall into that latter category, maybe except um, straight surveys that could still be prospective. So what we did here um, is proposed a special issue on research transparency uh, to the editors of comparative political studies. Uh, they took a gamble on this. As far as we're aware, this hadn't been tried in political science before. Uh, there was some discussion about how this would work, and, 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 and frankly, there was probably some risks associated with taking on a special issue of this form. Uh, but we worked it out to do a special issue uh, that would focus on two types of submissions, uh, pre-registered designs and results-free review. And, uh, and just a note, since I re referenced replication earlier, uh, comparative political studies has a replication uh, policy, so in all cases, replication uh, should have been assumed, uh, or the, the idea that, that files would need to be posted later was, should have been assumed by uh, contributors. Okay, so the process. Uh, we submitted a call for papers, um, advertised it pretty widely, advertised it through BITS, uh, through Paul Meth, which is the political methodology community, uh, through EGAP. I did a post on Monkey Cage, a number of other places, reached out to folks uh, as possible in the qualitative research community, um, and uh, did our best to, to circulate this pretty widely. Uh, we put in a notes uh, saying that the, the papers had to uh, not have been publicly presented or previously submitted to a journal. Okay, the idea here, and this is an implication I'll come back to in the conclusion, is 
if people are taking their completed studies and they're presenting them at the American Political Science Association or American Economic Association or wherever, then those results make it out there and potential reviewers would see the results and then may be evaluating based on that. So we indicated that papers had to come in uh, free of uh, pr past or sort of prior presentation or circulation. Uh, we had, uh, a f I think at least in a couple of cases, people say, that a paper had been presented like in a department workshop and they could list the individuals that were there and so we could had, and so I, I believe we still allowed one or two papers to come in where we sort of knew what the, what the network would have looked like. Um, but otherwise, uh, these are uh, fresh papers. And uh, throughout the entire process, neither the standing uh, comparative political studies editors nor the special editor, uh, special issue editors knew the results. In fact, uh, we still, we now only know the results of one uh, of the three that have been conditionally accepted um, for the, pro for the uh, special issue. The other two are supposed to come in, I believe, in the next week or so. Um, so we'll see what, what comes out of it. As far as submissions go, we, have, we received 19 full submissions. Uh, eight of those were desk rejected. I can talk about why we desk rejected some of them. One was uh, voluntarily withdrawn by, uh, by an author, and then we sent out 10 manuscripts for review. Uh, all submissions were handled otherwise very similar to how they would be with the standard CPS process. So um, they went through the Manuscript Central um, uh, editorial sort of platform and the, the editors assigned reviewers, made the requests and so forth. Uh, it turned out that 43 reviewer requests were sent, 16 were declined. This was a turn down rate uh, lower than what uh, CPS's average uh, normally is, so 37% compared to 47%. Probably there was something of a novelty to the, to the special issue which may have attracted uh, more reviewers. And uh, frankly, the reviewers were, were really, really terrific. I mean, compared to an average review, these most reviews were just fantastic. Again, m perhaps owing to the novelty of, of what was here. Uh, most reviewers commented both on the manuscript they were assigned as well as on the overall process of the special issue. Uh, broad results, three of the papers were given r, &R status um, and uh, seven were rejected. We then, uh, we then uh, let the, uh, the authors of these r revise and resubmit uh, papers make uh, revisions. Those would then went back to the original reviewers. All, in all three cases, the original reviewers proposed acceptance. So we went back to uh, those three papers and granted conditional acceptance. Okay, I come going back and forth between conditional and, and acceptance. We always said was it's conditional on just executing the research. Okay, and we're very clear that that had nothing to do with the final results. So long as they can, as long as they uh, executed exactly what they said. Uh, and if there were deviations, they noted the deviations, then at that point it didn't matter whether the results were null, positive, negative, anything else, uh, the, it was accepted. So it re really was just a way of saying you've actually got to go do the research, right, um, uh, so to, to cover ourselves there. And so we've received one paper, the other two coming soon. So four lessons learned. Um, and a note on this. Um, you know, we obviously don't know the counterfactual here. Uh, we couldn't randomize this. We're, you know, we're making some our best sort of guesses based on this process, uh, and so. But at least, you know, from what we could, uh, from what we could gather, seeing the whole review process, reading over uh, many times over the reviews and the papers and so forth, uh, four kind of key lessons uh, stood out to us. Um, so let me go through these each in turn. First, on the value of theory, it seems like in some of the discussions about uh, transparency and about pre-registration, uh, at least in political science and probably economics about uh, RCTs and, and sort of this process moving forward, that theory is maybe becoming undervalued. So long as you come up with a good identification strategy and you spend lots and lots and lots of time detailing the empirical approach, that uh, theory may play less of a role. So I've heard this from a number of individuals, some of them that we cite in the paper, uh, suggesting that um, theories may be being undervalued. If anything, we found the exact opposite, okay? So when reviewers were, uh, when, when reviewers couldn't sort of look at the results, what else could they look at? Well, they could look at the theory and they could look at the design. I think there was the standard kind of, uh, you know, whining about, uh, I shouldn't say whining, the standard uh, discussion of literature review and who should have been cited and who shouldn't have been cited. That's fine. We expect that, right? So, um, but there was just a, a tremendous emphasis on, on theory and making sure they got theory right. So, uh, reviewers identified um, and rejected hypothesis trolling, again, which is what I said, sort of this idea of stating a whole bunch of hypotheses in the, in the hopes that maybe one or two of those pan out and maybe you could report on those. 
those, uh, reviewers wouldn't have it. Okay? Um, reviewers also really spend a lot of time emphasizing correct theoretical specification. They really engage, um, again, in our sort of comparing to our own experience here, looking at a lot of other reviews, um, it just appeared that the emphasis on theoretical specification and the connection to specific empirical context was, was substantially better than, uh, than in most reviews. You know, it seems like in, uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of research, when we do it the standard way, do the review process the standard way, uh, you know, referees are sort of asking themselves the question, with which theory are the results consistent, right? So it's much easier to go to the, to, to the results and try to ask yourself, sort of like, you know, work backwards and, and think about whether the theory got it right or propose others, but always sort of with this anchoring point of where the results are. Um, when the results were not available, it appeared that um, you know, the, the, review, the theory had to stand on its own. Okay? So I guess a general lesson here from at least the, the, the small sample that we were able to evaluate is that it was impossible to be atheoretical um, or even kind of thinly theoretical and survive uh, results for your review. Uh, a second point that came out, and this might be, perhaps it's unique to the, um, uh, comparative political studies because it's kind of one of the flagship journals of the comparative uh, politics subfield. There was a, there was a large emphasis on uh, area expertise, okay? And there's been a big debate or, or kind of a lot of tension between cross-national comparative politics scholars and area studies experts uh, for, for many years now, a couple of decades at least. And, um, you know, the reviewer pool here uh, was a pretty sophisticated crowd, or many of them are a pretty sophisticated crowd, and yet pushed back very hard on ensuring that, uh, that authors really understood the institutional context and whether an intervention or a treatment uh, would even work or would be appropriate or otherwise in a, in a specific area, uh, asking questions about the meaning of key variables in a given country or in a given region and so forth. Um, and, and, and push beyond to, to think about external validity for um, uh, beyond that particular case. So, uh, you know, I guess that was sort of a, a second uh, lesson that, that came out of this, and we saw this from, um, from many of the reviews that, that pushing on area expertise seemed to really matter here. A third issue uh, is the interpretation of null results. So um, two kind of broader questions that we identified was, can null results be meaningful theoretically? and uh, which type of null findings are even worthy of publication. So it seemed like when reviewers made comments, they were kind of seemed to be thinking about, in the back of their mind, these two kind of broad sort of overarching questions here. The, um, you know, we saw the question in one form or another many times uh, of uh, the question uh, of if the tested hypotheses proved insignificant, would that move debates forward in any way? Okay, so reviewers were asking this time and time again, and in many of those papers, the answer was no. Okay? And in fact, in, one, in the case of one of the accepted papers, that one of the reviewers made this comment that uh, if it came back null, this would not advance the, the debate at all in this particular area. Okay? So uh, interesting on that, uh, reviewers hazard, hazarded guesses on different ideas here. It might be that Ethereum was uh, implausible in the first place. Uh, maybe reviewers, excuse me, maybe um, authors hadn't accounted for a simpler alternative, and maybe it was just the case that the theory and the research design were just so disconnected that, you know, when you come up with a null result, it may just not be all that meaningful in terms of reflecting back on the original question and theory that motivated. Um, reviewers were pretty open with us in signaling their discomfort with null results. Um, many of them, uh, or at least some of them, told us fairly, fairly directly. They just thought that papers with real results were, uh, when I, but I say null results, I say non-null results, okay, uh, were just inherently much more interesting to look at and consider, and they thought that maybe those were the ones that deserved to be there anyway uh, because of that. We sort of speculated amongst ourselves how would what would happen, um, or you know, if we went forward with a with a regime in which uh, results for your reviewing were allowed, how would authors adjust uh, the way they do their research? And uh, you know, I guess at least three possibilities stood out to us. One was that um, re, uh, you know authors might begin to or continue to position themselves as having a test of some, some sort of definitive test between two research, uh, two theories, in which a null result might be pretty meaningful because it might say, you know, a certain null result might say that one is right or one is wrong or both are wrong or whatever else it may be. Um, a second possibility is that they might offer their design as a, as a better test of prevailing theory, okay, so where an, a potential target is well known and, and therefore the null result might be 
uh, more meaningful, or they might just pr propose their tests as kind of the next logical step in a research tradition. Uh, all three seem to fit in kind of this notion of a, a Kuhnian sort of no normal science. And I think the author or the, the, the editors, special issue editors here were sort of split on whether this was a good thing in some cases thinking this is probably exactly what we need. In other cases, um, this may sort of crowd out more creative or kind of big question type uh, research. Uh, a final lesson is uh, we, had a, we didn't have a single qualitative submission, okay? And you know, for, for political science where uh, there at least has historically been kind of a division between quantitative and qualitative, uh, maybe kind of the, the gotten sort of the debate there has gotten maybe better in recent years, but still, um, we didn't have a single qualitative submission. In the call for papers in the very first paragraph, we say actually twice that we're interested in both quantitative and qualitative studies. Uh, we tried to reach out in various ways, um, but just didn't uh, receive any at all. So why is this the case? It might be that they just didn't hear about it. Uh, we tried to reach out as, as widely as we could, but it's still likely that many of the people just didn't hear about it. They might just not have been paying attention. Uh, compared to political studies, it has kind of somewhat of a reputation for being a, little, a more quantitatively oriented journal, uh, which likely played a role for qualitative scholars who um, saw that uh, this was a journal sponsoring the special issue. Um, it might be that qualitative scholars just really sort of believed that we were after experimental or statistical research, even though we said qualitative, but that was kind of the real hope for what would show up there. Uh, and maybe it's the case that qualitative research just isn't amenable. I think this split the special issue editors on uh, sort of this particular point. Um, and I think in our discussions, it seems that maybe if we could reach consensus on one thing, it would be that, that certain types of maybe more positivist qualitative research might be uh, fully amenable to pre-registration and results-free review. Uh, perhaps it's not the case with uh, post-positivist, non-positivist, interpretivist type research that pre-registration or results-free review could be, um, could be an effective uh, way of uh, doing review and, and whatnot, so. Okay, so a few conclusions. Um, yeah, so we're generally interested in understanding the benefits and the costs. Uh, we, you know, we outlined four different lessons. Again, I'll emphasize, we don't know the counterfactual, you know, had, could we have done an experiment, all those other things, we would have loved to have done it, right? But uh, as best we could tell, these are some of the lessons that, ca that came out of it. Three broader implications. One, this is one that gets discussed a lot, right? Null results could flood journals. Um, we don't. You know, we don't know on this, and uh, frankly, today, I still don't know because we only have one of the three papers. We've only seen results from one of the three. It would be interesting to see the other two and, and see what comes in across the three papers here. Um, I think that's still an open question. A bigger implication here is when is it appropriate to circulate and present work? If we go down this road of, of accepting manuscripts based on pre-registered designs and results-free submissions, we're going to have to fundamentally rethink uh, the, the conference presentation, right? Um, and, and this is, this is challenging, right? It's one thing to just say, okay, well, we'll just present results-free papers at our conferences. Um, but then, you know, it's possible that the, the overall quality of the, su of the submission when it comes to a journal is much lower, right? Because it just didn't get vetted well enough. And so sort of rethinking how we circulate our work when there's no results involved, um, you know, is, is what's going to be key here. One final conclusion is, uh, Pre-registration and results-free re reviewing may bottleneck the research process even further. So if you think about the research process, right, especially if you're doing some field-based research, you've got to come up with a design, you've got to go through IRB, you may have to pre-register it, you may have to pilot it, you've got to go out to the field, you've got to write it up, you've got to get it to the journal, you've got to go through review, r and &R, you know, all these sort of changes um, to finally get accepted a few years later. and. Um, you know, you add that onto that tenure considerations, family considerations, other things. This is maybe sort of one more hurdle that you have to kind of go through this process much earlier in the game, uh, which could uh, make for some challenges. So, and then finally, a big sort of what's next. Uh, this was a pilot at a time I think when pre-registration results for your review is just not well understood or not well known. It'd be really useful to try this again. Um, and be uh, interesting to hear ideas and thoughts about what would be useful to investigate. Um, and then I think the big sort of million dollar question here, $25,000 question is should all journals take up review of pre-registration results for your review? I think, you know, in theory, I think the special e issue editors are all, you know, we're on the transparency team, we like to see this, right? Uh, but there's a lot of, I guess, outstanding questions that would be really useful to learn about uh, before everything moves forward. So I'll stop there. Good. Yeah.